And I'll just say welcome uh, to everyone today to our local government education program brought to you by the University of Illinois Extension in the Illinois Association of County Board Members. My name is Mike Delaney and I'm an Extension Community and Economic Development Educator based in Ogle County up here in the Northern State Line region. Today's webinar, as you know, will address state legislative updates for 2023. We'll begin with uh, some quick housekeeping notes. We'll be recording today's webinar and we'll be making it available on Extension's YouTube channel. So after the conclusion of today's presentation, registered participants will receive an email with slides and a link to the recording of the webinar. If you didn't register in advance and somebody shared the link with you and you'd like to receive these materials, please just drop your email into the chat box and let us know and we'll make sure that you get on the mailing list for those materials. As always, you're welcome at any time over the course of the presentation to share your questions in the Zoom chat space. We will review the questions in a Q&A period following the presentations. Now, we're happy to welcome back to this long-running educational series our presenters for today, Kelly Murray and Taylor Anderson. Kelly has served as Executive Director for the Illinois Association of County Board Members since 1997. She's a registered lobbyist has served on several state boards and has over two decades of experience in local government relations. She's also a founder of the Institute for Excellence in County Governance in partnership with the University of Illinois. Taylor is a full-time registered contractual lobbyist in the state of Illinois, who spent nearly a decade working with the Illinois General Assembly. Prior to lobbying, Taylor worked with the Illinois Chamber of Commerce Government Affairs Division. He's also worked with the Illinois Association of County Board Members and Commissioners organizing seminars for county officials. With that, again, welcome, and thank you to you both for being here. Kelly, the microphone is yours. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, um, it's kind of hard for me to say, but I think I'm approaching three decades now when you said those dates, so that's a little scary. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone, to our annual legislative webinar. Um, I appreciate your participation today, and I want to do a special welcome to the newly elected officials who may be joining us. Uh, we had a nice session last week in Springfield on some educational opportunities regarding some legal issues and things you'll have to do to adhere to in the uh, county government office. So I'm hoping maybe a few of you are on this call again today and we'll keep this uh, momentum going on the educational level for all of you. Um, as you've probably found out by now, you know, local government is broad and at times um, the public service can be challenging. So I, I really applaud all of you for stepping up to take a leadership role in your communities. Uh, I've always believed that the local level of control is the heart of government, and we need to make sure that is maintained, and, and uh, we're listening to the voice of the citizens of Illinois. So as such, uh, we've been partnered with the University of Illinois Extension um, since about the early 1990s to provide these educational programs, in particular for county government leaders. Uh, today's webinar is just an arm of that ongoing education. I'm assuming that we will be working with Nancy and Mike and the staff of U of I Extension on some additional webinars on uh, local government related topics as the year continues. The Illinois Association of County Board Members, just to give you a little background, like, uh, like Mike said, we were established uh, in, in the 1960s. We remain uh, the primary organization in the state to advocate for counties. Uh, the ongoing support and networking that all of you as county officials bring to the association and our state policy platform is a very valued uh, service, I think, to the residents throughout our great state. So uh, again, thank you for that. Keep in mind, we, we try to work very uh, diligently on behalf of county governments here in Springfield. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize our current president. It's Michael Holliday, Jr. He's a longstanding member of the Madison County Board. I know some of you met him for the first time last week in Springfield, and he's available to you as well. He has a wealth of knowledge as a, as a long-term board member, and he's been involved with the State Association and also working on policy in Springfield for a long time. Um, our presentation today will primarily focus on new laws for 2023 that impact local government. Uh, I want you to kind of keep this in mind that in any given year, an estimated one in six bills impacts local government. So when we see upwards of 10 to 12,000 bills passed uh, or introduced in a two-year cycle, you can kind of imagine the time and effort it takes to monitor and advocate for counties, cities, as well as townships in any given year here in Springfield. 
So also remember that the association, we, we work in a bipartisan, pragmatic, and, and effective manner to secure wins throughout session, and that's important. We have to work with counties in every area of the state, and we have to come together to advance the priorities of the Illinois counties and our members. So uh, I can't stress this enough, but your connection with your state lawmakers is vital. Uh, we, are, we are here to kind of keep you informed of the county-related bills and status. We'll provide testimony in, and, and share that responsibility with you at the state capitol in committees. But keep in mind, you are the local voice. So make sure your lawmakers know that you are aware of, of active legislation, especially when it impacts local control. Um, and you'll see some of those examples today uh, of why that's so important. The, the spring session schedule, um, you know, the Illinois General Assembly adjourned um, the 2022 spring session in the very early morning hours of April 9th. And when I say the very early morning hours, I'm talking, you know, bill changes coming at four o'clock in the morning and maybe adjournment around six. And it was a marathon of debates kind of focused. Uh, obviously, we had some crime related legislation, but uh, budget priorities. Um, it was very quick and, and fast paced those last few days. The April 9th adjournment was the earliest adjournment date in recent decades, and um, it was a result of the delayed redistricting process that led to a deferred June 28th primary election. Uh, so that's kind of why we saw that little change in schedule. The veto session was then held, uh, began in November, but again, it was somewhat lighter than usual. So then we were moving in with the swearing in of the new uh, General Assembly members, but prior to that, we had the sort of the five-day lame duck session arose. And that is where we saw several measures kind of moving fast and furious, uh, some of which impact counties. So we'll talk about those today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our legislative consultant, Taylor Anderson, to get us started on the, on the new laws review and also some of those, you know, those last minute lame duck outcomes. I'll circle back with you at the end of the, uh, today's program to share some educational resources with you as well. So Taylor. Thanks, Kelly, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us on today's call. I always appreciate the opportunity um, to look at the past General Assembly and, and session and kind of do a year in review. As Kelly mentioned, there are a number of bills uh, that get introduced every two-year uh, General Assembly cycle, and of those bills, about one in six uh, become law. So in 2022, we saw about 400 bills up uh, pass through both chambers and be considered by the governor. Overall, in the 102nd General Assembly, we had about 1,116 bills. So there's a couple more bills out there um, still waiting for gubernatorial action. And so that number could possibly creep up a little further. What that all means is, as Kelly you know, described, there's a lot of pieces of legislation that get introduced every year, many of which impact counties and local government in some form or fashion. And many of those bills end up becoming laws. And so it's important that not only do we pay attention as those bills are introduced um, and they move through the legislative process, but also as they become law of Illinois and um, they have start having consequences for how your county and local government works and functions. So with that said, we'll look at uh, some of the highlights of the 102nd General Assembly, uh, especially this, this past year. And as Kelly mentioned, we'll touch on some of the bills that were passed during the lame duck session, which took place um, in the entirety of 2023. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll start out with uh, the budget. As Kelly mentioned earlier, um, the General Assembly really lasted until long hours, I guess is probably the um, best way to, to describe it. Um, six in the morning was when they adjourned and the final pieces of that process were you know, related to budgetary matters. And so um, unlike prior years, especially recent prior years, we had a surplus in Illinois and that's unique certainly in the last 10 years that, that Illinois has had, had a surplus and, and last year was about, excuse me, a couple billion dollars. Um, overall, the total budget was $46.5 billion, a slight increase um, from fiscal year 2022. And if you look at the slide, kind of just breaks down a little bit of 
some of the local we given dollars. So everything from LGDF, which had a slight increase, that was one of the issues we spoke about last year. Um, local governments Taylor? who received, yes. Taylor, uh, your slides advanced. Could you double check and see if? Oh, I'm sorry. Can I go into that slide now, Mike? There we go. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so as you can now see, um, the budget was about $46.5 billion. Uh, there was a $1.8 billion, um, and that came from the surplus, generated and used for temporary tax relief, everything from a relief on grocery tax, um, you know, some other sales tax relief, um, relief and gas tax. Uh, and then again, as I was describing those bullet points underneath, you kind of see some of those distributions down to, you know, to local government. Um, as I was saying, there was a slight increase on the local government distributive fund. And that has been a push that units of local government who received those funds ha have been making. Historically, that um, has always been at a 10% threshold down to units of local government. So back when the constitution was redone uh, in the, the mid seventies in the state of Illinois, it was agreed upon that local governments would give up their ability to have their own income tax. And in return for that, the state would collect, set and collect the income tax levels and then remit down to units of local government a 10% um, percentage points of, of what the state collects. Because of the state's financial um, strife over the last, again, decade, um, you know, from the Great Recession and, and moving on into, um, you know, the three-year budget impasse that took place uh, recently, we've seen that number drop uh, down, to, down to 6%. And so there's been a push to try to get those percentage back up to 10, where it was uh, has historically been and, and rightfully so because those dollars are generated, you know, at the local level. I want to make sure that they're getting back to localities um, so that they can be spent and utilized for services in the community. Um, <clears throat> we won't go through all of the, the various things, but we wanted to give kind of a snapshot. Um, a quickly, just moving forward, we are projected to again, once again, have a surplus for the FY24 budget. That dollar figure is still um, kind of in flux. I've heard everywhere from $1.5 billion surplus um, to maybe a little higher or possibly a little lower. And so I think um, we'll, we'll know more once the governor gives his budget address um, early in February. Again, this just kind of gives a quick list of some of the bills we're gonna be talking about today. Um, as Kelly again mentioned, they adjourned last year on April 9th, uh, which is a very early adjournment date. Normally, uh, spring session lasts until May 31st. Uh, and this year, uh, for spring 2023 session, we'll also have an early adjournment date. It won't be as early as last year, where they adjourned on April 9th, but this year they're scheduled to adjourn on May 19th, which is a couple weeks earlier than normal. Um, and so we'll see if they're able to, to, to meet that deadline. Hopefully this time they won't need to stay in until uh, six in the morning, but um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see if the General Assembly is able to, um, able to meet what they need to do in, in, in order to adjourn on time. I will say that a 20 hour session day makes for a very long day and an extremely long next day. The first bill we'll talk about is Senate Bill 1975. Again, all the bills that we're gonna be talking about have been signed into law. One of the things that I think we really wanted to, to talk about, um, the reason why we wanted to talk about this bill is obviously property tax has been one of those topics of conversation um, that we've heard a lot of, not only in the media, but also from members of the General Assembly um, and it's on people's minds. Residents are, are very concerned with um, you know, high property taxes and sometimes they don't quite understand not only residents, but members of the General Assembly about how the property tax system really works. And so one of the things that I think is important about this um, bill, besides of the, um, you know, the change they're making to PTAIL, um, 
is they're going to start looking at uh, some of these homestead exemptions. So, you know, a couple of years ago, we saw um, the general homestead exemption in Cook County be raised. Uh, and so this is also going to raise those exemptions um, across the board. Uh, we'll also see an increase for, for senior homestead exemptions. Again, this was done several years ago for Cook County. And, and now um, we're seeing um, those kind of be raised in, in, in other counties as well. And so um, part of that is because again, the, the pressure that um, property taxes are having on homeowners. But I think one of the, the conversations that um, is just now starting to make its way through the General Assembly. And again, we've got a lot of new members in the General Assembly for the 2023 or for the 103rd General Assembly. Um, and so they're, they're going to need to be educated on some of these things, but homestead exemptions and, and senior exemptions, while they are, um, you know, certainly beneficial and, and useful, um, those dollars that they're removing from the levy, um, in effect, increases the tax burden on people who don't qualify for exemptions. And so, um, again, these are very popular, especially during election years uh, to pass, but that conversation needs to really um, be drilled down into because sometimes these, these exemptions can have an outside effect um, on other members, other homeowners in the community. And so um, I know that that's going to be a conversation that's going to continue um, to be had during this spring session, I imagine, um, you know, throughout this year and throughout potentially next year. It's the property tax in Illinois are, are messy, very complicated, and um, you know, trying to educate all the members of the General Assembly ab about property taxes has, has been a bit of a struggle. And so hopefully we'll continue to, to have these conversations and, and educate more members of the General Assembly um, about some of the pros and cons when, when we look at increasing you know, exemptions or expanding the number of exemptions that are out there and how they can um, impact uh, other homeowners throughout the county. Move on to our next slide. This is Senate Bill 3120. Um, this was a bill that was originally kind of discussed in a little different format uh, back in 2021. Um, and then, you know, this um, bill was, was reintroduced and, and kind of expanded a little bit. It's law and it's important to make sure that you update, um, you know, your, your HR codes and um, county uh, employee uh, documents to, to understand that this is now gonna be law or uh, it is currently law as it took effect in, in January 1st. Essentially, it allows for an employee to take off um, for grieving and it expands um, the list of eligible um, bereavements uh, or, or folks that you know you can you can utilize to in order to take time off. So originally, this was um, really pushed forward uh, by you know parents who who had lost a child, um, and so this now expands it to spouses, siblings, parents, uh, domestic partners, uh, grandchildren, mother-in-law, father-in-law grandparents or a step parent. Um, it also allows for additional time um, for this list of categories below. I, again, I won't go through all of them, but we want to make sure that we're in compliance with this new law um, and that your, you know, your rule books and handbooks for employees um, are updated to make sure you're in compliance with this law. Another new law is Senate Bill 3019. Um, this one is, and I'm not quite sure the genesis of this, um, but, you know, obviously there's, this appeared to be a loophole that, that they wanted to make sure they closed. And so just make sure, uh, making sure that, um, you know, child sex offenders, um, you know, cannot operate, manage, or be employed by, um, you know, carnivals, amusement, um, situations or, or county or state fairs. Um, again, this certainly... I don't think many people would um, knowingly do that, but we want to make sure that it's clear that um, someone who is, is a registered child sex offender is no longer able to uh, be employed or associated with 
um, things that are really targeted um, toward the youth in Illinois. The next bill is Senate Bill 3187. This is kind of a, um, you know, we're seeing more of these type of bills to, I guess, modernize how um, the clerical functions um, happen at both the state and local levels. And so this would allow for a physical or an electronic image of the recorder stamp to stat uh, satisfy the signature re requirement. And so, again, a lot of transactions now are, are taking place digitally. Uh, this just kind of brings, um, you know, the recorder stamp into into the new age. Um, I imagine we'll we'll continue to see more of these type of attempts to modernize um, what you know traditionally has been a, a hands-on hard copy um, system. You know, we are. I know that there have been conversations looking at um, updating and modernizing things uh, with regards to Local Records Act and a whole host of of things. So, what I would encourage you is as you're you know, meeting with a county board or as you're meeting with um, your administrators or people who work, um, you know, in the various offices within the county, uh, try to keep track of, um, you know, those instances where, you know, there might be an ability to, to save dollars or save time by making, um, you know, things more modern and, and allowing for, you know, more digital, uh, faster pace um, transactions to happen because certainly those are things we want to bring to the General Assembly and uh, there seems to be an appetite to, to make sure that um, there is kind of a, a modernization um, taking place. Uh, the last bill on this slide is Senate Bill 3633. This is uh, a, a new change. It deals with uh, demolition documentation. There was a specific in instance um, in Southern Cook County where um, you know, documents weren't maintained by a, uh, a contractor who was doing some work for the county uh, with regards to um, the hours that certain employees were uh, were working on this demolition project. And so uh, a bill was introduced to actually force counties and municipalities to um, be the ones to document, um, you know, these, these um, you know, this type of work. And we're able to work with the proponents and the sponsor of the bill to make sure that it's it's really going to be the contractor um, who has that information and is, it should be the one responsible for uh, generating um, those documentations. But it has to be they have to submit it to the county or municipality, and the county or municipality um, has to maintain those documents. So. Uh, instead of the county being responsible for, you know, going out and doing the documentation, now the county just has to maintain those documents when they're submitted. So what I would encourage um, you all to do is as work is being done um, in the county to, you know, whether there's any kind of construction or demolition, just make sure you're working with the contractor uh, that you hire to get that documentation um, from them. Um, obviously, you know, these uh, documentations could be FOIA'd. Uh, and so we want to just make sure that, that counties are uh, complying with this new legislation. Uh, and again, you just have to maintain it. Um, you know, you don't have to actually go out and, and do the documentation yourself. Move, move to the next slide, excuse me. <clears throat> um, because I know there's probably going to be questions, I'm going to jump around a little bit. So. Um, I make sure that there's enough time. Uh, we'll move to Senate Bill 3939. Uh, this deals with cybersecurity. The reason why this bill is on here is because we know that um, cybersecurity is one of those issues that, that seems to be getting a lot of attention now, uh, especially for units of government, not just locally, but, but also at the state level. Um, you know, particularly uh, brings to mind when Attorney General Raul was um, sworn in uh, this spring, um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, he actually made reference to uh, when the attorney general's office um, suffered a ransomware attack and how difficult that was on his office um, because they still had to do their their day to day jobs. Um, and they had several lawsuits uh, dealing with consumer protection and other things going on simultaneously while their while their websites down. And so units of local government um, have now started to move into the crosshairs of these hackers and these criminals who, um, you know, use certain type of um, 
you know, malware and spyware and ransomware uh, to, to try to hold um, and, and receive dollars uh, from the folks they target. A couple of years ago, it was a, a really big, uh, you know, push towards, you know, financial industries and, um, you know, online, um, you know, uh, sales areas and, and folks. Then it kind of switched over to, to hospitals and healthcare industries. And so, you know, it now looks like government it has, has become the, the next uh, big target. And so <clears throat> it's good to see the bills like this. Uh, what I really like about this bill is that this will, A, it, a, it, it asks or requires the local government to um, appoint an employee or official to act as a primary contact for local cybersecurity issues. So we're gonna make sure A, that you do that at your county. Um, someone in the county needs to be a point person. Again, it can be an elected official or it, or it can be staff. Um, but what it also does is establish um, some training programs to help local governments uh, combat cybersecurity. Now, as I said, this is one of those issues that uh, I don't think this is this solves all the problems. Certainly, I think we're going to uh, see more pieces of legislation uh, dealing with cybersecurity aimed at units of local government. But this is kind of a first a first blush at it, and the fact that you know the uh, the Secretary of Innovation and Technology is going to start a program to try to assist local governments educate. Um, local governments about this new threat, I, I think will be very beneficial. You know, we'd love to see in the coming years an expansion of things like tort immunity to help protect units of local government who might be victims of, of um, you know, a, a cyber attack. So uh, again, this is a kind of a new area um, and, um, you know, we're hoping to see more legislation and help pass more legislation to protect um, counties and other units of local government from these from these new threats. Um, I think one of the things we've also kind of seen across the country is uh, an increase in liability coverage, um, partly due to the increased exposure um, for cybersecurity. And so again, you know, we'd like to see conversations continue on this topic, but we think this is a good um, first step, at least, where the state is going to start providing some uh, assistance and training uh, to employees to and, and to county governments to hopefully um, just educate people and, and have a more robust system in place, again, as we try to work on some of the other issues um, related to, to this new threat. Uh, another bill, we'll move into House bills now, is House Bill 209. Um, you know, this was uh, one of those, again, kind of a, a, I won't say new, there's been, um, you know, latex allergies out there for a while, but um, it certainly seems that to, to maybe have grown in, in prevalence. And so this restricts the use of latex gloves in, in food prep and medical services. Um, just want to make sure that, uh, you know, county health boards uh, and others are kind of aware of, of these new regulations revolving around um, latex gloves. Uh, for for years, that has obviously been the norm, and and you know when you purchase things, you just kind of buy latex gloves in bulk. But um, there are going to be some new restrictions, and so we encourage um, local governments and counties to make sure that you know maybe you review some of your purchasing that you have. Uh, if you do any kind of um, you know if you do make large purchases, um, obviously this doesn't just affect food preparation, but this also affects, uh, you know, medical services. So, you know, think EMT, fire protection districts, et cetera. So we want to just make sure that um, that folks are aware of this, um, you know, as kind of the number of people who are, are um, presented with latex um, allergies uh, seems to continue to grow. The last bill on this slide is House Bill 4489. Um, this deals with GATA or the Grant Accountability and Transparency Act. And <clears throat> I will say that since GATA was passed, um, I want to say four years ago now, um, there have been a number of um, kind of concerns just brought to um, certainly my attention, but, but other concerns and other folks' um, attentions raised by units of local government, uh, kind of how 
uh, in certain areas, there's already um, really robust uh, data, transparency, and rules and regulations. And so GATA um, seems to be a, a, a duplication of some of those um, already existing frameworks in place um, to make sure that there's transparency and that things are done in the correct manner. And so what that ends up doing is it just tends to slow down um, that process quite a bit and um, adding you know, an additional unnecessary step on top of the steps that are already taken. And so what this bill um, did, and we were supportive of this as, as we were supportive of removing uh, GATA requirements from things like MST, local government distribute fund, et cetera, et cetera, is this removes um, dollars that are, are flowing for transportation purposes, um, either from state funds, federal funds, or when there's a combination of, of state and, and federal funds. IDOT already has a very rigorous um, you know, requirement, and um, you know, they do thorough checks on, on those dollars that are flowing either from the state to local governments or from the federal government through the state to local governments. And so um, you know, hopefully this kind of frees up and moves that transfer of dollars um, you know, more quickly uh, than, it, than we had seen under GATA. Um, so obviously, you know, there's a, a, a short window, especially here in the Midwest, uh, where when construction season can kind of begin and end. And so we want to make sure that, um, you know, this duplicative nature wasn't slowing the start of those projects down. I will say that, um, you know, we've passed, I think this is the second or third um, piece of legislation in the last three years or so that have, you um, made exceptions to the Grant Accountability and Transparency Act um, for particular uh, dollars, again, flowing from the state to local governments or from the federal government to the state to local governments. Um, and I don't necessarily know that this is gonna be um, the end of, of this conversation. Um, this bill took effect in, in June. Um, so you know, over the summer, and again, the hope was to, to try to get those dollars out the door so, so projects could start. Uh, I have been made aware of, uh, and Kelly has been made aware of, um, you know, certain agencies within the gov governor's administration who have um, maintained uh, this hyper vigilance. I would say um, on, on some of these on some of these dollars. Uh, again, if you apply for, um, you know, federal dollars and there's a state match and you get that, you had to fill out all kinds of work already for both. The federal government and the state government on top of that then having to go through GATA just seems unnecessary and so uh, we are still seeing some agencies be a little slow to incorporate these new exemptions um, into their process and so there, there still seems to be some tension um, there and so we're going to going to be continuing to work with legislators uh, and hopefully the governor's administration and um, directors of, of those agencies where this still seems to be a problem even though we we've had we have laws on the books now um, that should hopefully in theory um, resolve the problem, there, that doesn't seem to necessarily be the case. And so we'll continue to have those conversations and hopefully be able to to work through them um, without needing to go back to the general assembly. However, if um, if that's where those conversations lead, uh, we certainly have um, you know folks in the general assembly who understand the need to make sure those dollars are, are moving freely. And um, you know maybe we, we might have to go there again, but but hopefully we can just have some conversations and internally the governor's office and uh, their agencies can um, make sure they're complying with with the new laws. Uh, another bill that we wanted to make sure, or some more bills we wanted to make sure we talked about is House Bill, excuse me, <coughs> um, 4700. Again, this bill um, signed the law. Uh, this makes a change to the sheriff's salary and sets it at not less than 80% of the salary set for the state's attorneys. Um, you know, this bill was introduced and we, and we saw a couple different um, methodologies to, to pay for this. Um, it was originally going to be paid for out of um, the state's uh, general revenue fund. However, at the last second, again, as Kelly kind of mentioned, uh, things happen very fast in those waning days of spring session. And at the last second, 
this bill was changed to make those um, those salaries be paid out of the personal property uh, replacement tax. And um, you know, obviously, we have seen over the years uh, several um, salaries and and funds be paid for out of the personal property um, re replacement tax. And um, because of that, we have seen the number uh, of dollars going to local governments out of that fund um, diminish by quite a bit. Uh, I think they first started, it, it, the General Assembly first started to, to turn towards um, this fund uh, in about 2010 or so, maybe it was 2011. Um, you know, at that time, all of those dollars were being remitted to units of local government, whether it's the city of Chicago, whether it's, you know, McLean County or Sangamon County, all the way down um, to the end of the state. Um, since then, as I said, we've seen kind of various, um, you know, I won't call them sweeps, but we, we've seen various diversions out of um, the personal property replacement tax. And I think now, the last last time I looked, and I, and I haven't um, that's not including this new bill, but the last time uh, I saw numbers prepared about the diversions out of that fund, it was upwards of, of nearly $300 million a year. Um, back in 2011, that fund was at, you know, $1.4 billion fund. Again, so we're, you know, we're getting to the point now where we're, you know, we're, we're seeing very large chunks of that money being diverted to pay for um, really kind of normally state um, assumed responsibilities, and, and now they're taking funds away um, from units you know, of local government to, to pay for other things. And so, this is something that we're, uh, you know, continue to, to be watchful uh, of. Um, this is a little known fund for most members of the General Assembly, and so they don't quite understand um, all of where these dollars go. But I, I do know I've spoken to several counties that have seen over the years the amount of money they receive from the fund um, diminished by quite a bit. So, again, just uh, if you're paying attention or watching uh, the amount of dollars you get, you might see a hit, and um, this is one of the reasons why. Uh, the next bill is House Bill 4700. Um, you know, broadband infrastructure has been, um, you know, a priority for a while uh, for a number of, a number of folks. Um, there's been some, uh, um, I guess resistance um, from from some in the industry to giving more leadway or allowing more um, you know leadway for uh, for counties who especially you know haven't received a lot of attention or investment um, you know there's kind of been a, a halt attempts to halt uh, more investment in, in some of those areas um, and so this gives the legislative Budget Oversight Commission authority to advise and review planned expenditures of state and federal grants for broadband projects. Um, as part of um, ARPA that, that the, uh, the federal government passed, a lot of those dollars or one of the uses of those dollars could be for um, broadband infrastructure. Uh, the state received a lot of money too, again, for broadband infrastructure. And so this kind of just codifies and makes sure that there are, um, you know, this body has the legislative um, over or the authority from the legislative body uh, to advise and, and kind of review some of those planned expenditures with the hopes of expanding broadband access, uh, especially in, in rural and certain urban areas across the state. And so we, we hope to see more of this. Um, you know, obviously, as we talked about modernization for things like, um, you know, stamps and local record keeping, it's really challenging to do that if you don't have the proper uh, infrastructure to make sure you're able to connect and operate digi digitally. So um, we're hoping that, you know, we'll, we'll see more of um, more money and more grants flow down um, so that everyone can enjoy um, you know, good broadband um, access. Move to the next slide. Um, House Bill 5184, I'm sure um, several counties on the call have um, heard about this bill or, um, you know, made aware of this bill. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This made some changes to how Veterans Assistance Commission uh, and counties kind of operate. And um, this bill passed in the spring 
it takes or took effect, excuse me, on January 1st of, of 2023, um, really kind of um, made a distinction between how VACs and counties um, should interact and um, where they stand as kind of separate entities. This really, in my mind, um, created kind of a delineation between VACs as their own organization um, in county government. I think a lot of prior to this, um, this bill being introduced, a lot of counties kind of viewed a VAC as similar to other departments underneath the county. And this bill really makes sure that it's understood that VACs are, um, while they are connected to the county, they're, they're their own separate entity. Uh, there was a trailer, a piece of trailer um, legislation that was approved during the lame duck session, which is House Bill 2369. Um, if you look at the top of the slide under House Bill 5184, you know, you'll notice that it removes the Illinois Department of Human Service Oversight on the administration of some of those funds. Um, the lame duck session amendment of House Bill 2369 now moves um, some of that oversight under the purview of the Attorney General's office. Uh, and that was at the behest of the Attorney General's office. And so uh, again, just, just to be clear, this really kind of separates uh, where VAC stand uh, in regards to counties. And so there's a lot of information I know Kelly has um, you know, provided. I'm sure it's on the website. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to, to contact and, and do some outreach to Kelly. Uh, about these new laws and, and how that might change things um, from how you were previously interacting with your VACs. Um, we'll talk about another bill that was um, introduced and passed during lame duck session. This is House Bill 4412. Um, as we kind of talked about, and I think Kelly hinted at, uh, we had a very robust lame duck session. We had a very light veto session in November and early December, but we had a very robust lame duck session in early January. Um, probably one of the most uh, robust and impactful lame duck sessions I think we've had uh, certainly in recent memory. And this bill uh, is included on that. I will say that um, this bill was introduced and passed within a matter of days. Uh, there was not a real um, um, there wasn't a real opportunity for um, conversation among stakeholders. Um, you know, we find out about this bill quite late uh, in the day when it was amended um, and, you know, had some brief conversations with the sponsors of the bill, but were not um, invited or allowed to sit down and negotiate over some of the provisions and some of the changes that this, um, that this bill um, attempted to do. Um, because of that, I think we will um, will continue to have conversations about this bill. Um, I know on the House floor, the House sponsor um, seemed to recognize that there might be some challenges with how uh, this bill was drafted and left the door open, I'll say, for um, further conversations and a potential trailer bill uh, to maybe address some of those concerns um, for spring session of 2023. So we hope to continue to, to partner with um, folks that had concerns with this bill and maybe be able to sit down and, and address at least some of those concerns, but probably not all. Uh, in a nutshell, what this bill does is it, is it set a statewide ceiling for siting requirements for both wind and solar. And again, this is commercial scale wind and solar. We're not talking about um, you know residential solar um, you know, on, on the roof of a home, you know, we're not talking about, you know, a small, um, you know, wind turbine or, or something on, on a building. We're talking commercial scale wind and solar. Um, and like I said, this creates a ceiling. So that means a local government cannot exceed the requirements that the state has set. Um, it also sets some pretty tight uh, I think that's probably the nicest way I can say it. Some pretty tight um, deadlines for when the approval process needs to take place. So, um, you know, a public hearing needs to be conducted uh, within 45 days uh, after filing of an application. And then after a public hearing, the county has 30 days um, to approve 
um, an application. Again, there's some there's some challenges in here, and and, and we'll have more uh, conversations about this. Certainly, if you um, have an opportunity to to go through this, or or your zoning department um, uh, or, or uh, officers have an opportunity to go through this, we would love feedback as we prepare to sit down uh, with the sponsors and address um, some of the concerns that that are presented within this bill. Um, this 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 particular bill was a challenge. And I think it will continue to be a challenge, even if your county um, already has a robust uh, partnership with either wind, solar, or, or perhaps both. This really is going to make some changes to, to how um, your zoning process currently works. And uh, we'd love to have some feedback so we can take those concerns um, to the sponsors and, again, hopefully um, address some of them via trailer legislation. Uh, this is just some more of um, uh, provisions in the bill. Um, you know, there's some conflicts in there with regards to zoning language. There's some, um, you know, there's some issue to, um, you know, setbacks. They don't make a distinction between, um, you know, different uh, building structures for setbacks. This is just kind of a one size fits all. Um, and again, the setbacks are from um, the building itself not necessarily from a playground or from a park, um, et cetera, thing, things of that nature. And so again, um, if you have the opportunity, please review this bill. Um, I know, like I said, Kelly has some good information up regarding it. Um, and if you have questions uh, or feedback, please, uh, please reach out. We'd love to hear. Uh, this is just some important dates as we kind of uh, wrap up our conversation. Um, February 15th is the governor's state of the state address and the budget address. Um, these are the various um, you know, deadlines for either bills getting out of uh, their committee of their uh, chamber of or origin uh, or out of the, the chamber of origin itself uh, for third reading. Uh, and then <clears throat> uh, you'll see at the bottom that that date of May 19th is when um, the General Assembly is, is anticipated uh, to try to adjourn this year, have a budget done, have all the bills passed, um, and then they won't convene again. We don't have dates yet, but they wouldn't convene again, uh, likely until veto session, usually held sometime in either November or December. So with that, Kelly, I don't know if you wanted to, to add anything um, as we kind of wrap up. Okay, if, if not, um, if she doesn't have anything to add, I'll just say this next slide here at the bottom is, is the email. Um, and there's also a booklet uh, that Kelly puts together um, every year dealing with the new law summaries. And then if uh, you're a new uh, county board member or new like an official, um, counties at the Capitol is something that Kelly puts out in emails um, on a pretty regular basis throughout uh, the year. Uh, throughout spring session and throughout veto session. And this is a really good opportunity and a really good guide to um, important pieces of the legislation that are being moved through the legislative process. Um, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, Kelly and I go through all of the bills, we read all the bills, and it is um, you know, a list compiled of those bills we think are most likely to, to move or have the greatest impact um, on a county. And so it's very important uh, that if you want to stay involved um, in the political process as legislation is moving, um, that Kelly has your email address or where you'd like her to send the counties at the Capitol. Because again, it's um, I think it's one of the best um, lists out there, one of the best legislative updates out there that really goes uh, pretty in depth and, and uh, outlines some of the most impactful bills that, that are being moved. Um, through the legislative process. And Mike, I don't know, uh, Kelly says she's still muted, so I, I think she does. Okay, I, um, I, okay, I was unmuted perfect. by the extension, so I was trying to unmute, I apologize. So I think, uh, yeah, Taylor, you covered most of what we have with respect to some resources. Um, I would like, like to mention that last Friday, we did a training session in Springfield. Some of you may attend it. It was really for our newly elected officials, but we do have some good resources up on our website. 
One of the resources um, I'd like to convey to you is our Inside the Courthouse publication. It outlines all of the offices within Illinois County government and some of the special purpose districts. If you go on our website under the events uh, tab at the top, you'll see newly elected officials training. And when you tap on that, you'll be able to access the inside the courthouse updated uh, brochure uh, program that we put out. You will also have some updates with respect to some legal training that we provided there. And that is very important for local government officials. So we covered ethics and public integrity. We covered parliamentary procedures for meetings, uh, the Open Meetings Act, as well as the access to public records with FOIA. You'll find on that same uh, page on our site a couple booklets that answer some questions in general to Open Meetings Act and Freedom of Information Act. Um, if you're a newly elected official, you might want to take a look at those. Even if you're a veteran official, it, it doesn't hurt to uh, refresh on that um, because there, we do know there are sometimes changes to state law. I will, um, what I will do, Nancy, if you're sending out this recording to those on the call with us today, I will send you the new laws summary, which is pictured there on the screen that Taylor referenced. We uh, actually published that in November after the veto session, so we will not include a couple of those lame duck measures that we talked about today. However, it is a pretty broad representation with various um, areas that affect local government as a whole outside of just county government. So that is a member uh, publication. We give that to our members. So I don't mind at this point. It's not really available on our website, but I can give it to you, um, Nancy. And if you send the link out to those uh, on the call today, they will get that publication. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, Taylor, uh, we're going to do two things simultaneously. Uh, as we start to address some of the questions that were in the chat, we're also going to put a quick poll and ask for our attendees to give a quick reaction to it um, before they depart the gathering today. So uh, a lot of the questions uh, that were submitted over the course of Taylor's comments were answered in real time by uh, by Kelly, but there are a couple still hanging out there. I'll circle back to those. Um, question, we'll see if you can answer this. Does the cybersecurity issue apply to townships? Couldn't hear the question. Mike, sorry. Go ahead, Kelly. Oh, go ahead, Taylor. I couldn't hear the question well. Sorry. That was, yeah, that was going to be my, I, could, I couldn't hear the question um, either. Sorry. Does, does the security issue apply to townships? Yes, um, it, it specifies local governments. Um, now, I know that there, not all local governments um, have, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, robust websites and things of that nature. Um, I would still suggest that a local government, um, you know, go ahead and, you know, just issue a point person um, for that. Right. And I put in the chat box, if you don't have, you know, we know some of our um, local governments, maybe on townships levels and others may be smaller staff than a county, you may not have someone that could be designated, but the chief executive officer uh, could, could be that designation. So therefore the township supervisor or, you know, county board chair or someone in that respect as well could, uh, could be the designee. I think it's important that you do this as well, because again, they're talking about training. They may at some point talk about um, assisting with um, funding uh, various programs. Um, it's important that you get, um, get registered with the state and comply with the act, because like I said, it is a shall, you have to comply. So I think the sooner you do this, the better, because again, I think they're trying to offer some assistance to local governments uh, with respect to the um, to the cybersecurity issues that we keep confronting. And, and we know this is going to keep growing and especially with government and some of our smaller governments are probably not as well prepared as larger ones in this area. So any, any type of training assistance I think we can get from the state is valuable. Yeah, and, and uh, Kelly's right. I, again, I, I would encourage um, you know, folks to, to do this. There are some parameters. I, 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 off the top of my head, I can't remember what the population threshold is 
um, you know, for a municipality, but certainly every county needs to do this. Um, I would imagine, um, and I'll have to go back and look, and, and Kelly can certainly follow up. Uh, Kelly and I can follow up with folks, uh, especially the person who asked the question. Um, there might be, it might not uh, include all townships in it, but I, I still, as Kelly said, I think it wouldn't hurt to go ahead and do that. And again, it could be the, the chief executive officer. Um, I, I just, as I mentioned during my comments, this is an area uh, that I think we're moving towards. Um, and so I don't, I don't think it would be harmful to get, to get out in front of this, um, you know, even if it only applies to, you know, municipalities of, of a certain size. And, and again, I think it applies to all counties, but um, this is, this is direction, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of moving towards. Um, and so I, again, I don't, I certainly don't think it would help, especially for, uh, or hurt, excuse me, especially for um, larger townships that already have websites and uh, things of that nature. Um, it, I think it would be a good idea. Thank you. Um, another question on one of the other bills that you'd mentioned, who will have oversight over the VACs? Who is their governing body? That's a, that's a very good question. And I will say that um, during conversations regarding the trailer bill, um, that question was asked um, by members of the General Assembly. And, and I think um, that conversation isn't over there is no direct oversight over the VAC. And again, um, some of the conversations I had with legislators, um, there, there, was, there seemed to be some worry that there would be you know, public dollars and, and certainly potentially a, 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 a property tax levied. And it didn't seem like there was direct oversight. Um, as I mentioned, the Attorney General's office have, has oversight over you know, how those dollars are spent. Um, and if there's any, um, anything done that is improper, it would be up to the attorney general's office to, to kind of come in under their uh, consumer protection uh, powers um, to regulate the VAC. Okay, with respect to 4412, we've got a question. If we have other requirements in zoning for solar and wind, are those requirements needing to be removed from our ordinance? Um, the bill mandates that um, the county ordinances or all county ordinances uh, that are in conflict with the state statute need to be changed uh, to meet um, and not exceed the state statute. And I forget the number of days that a county has. I, I believe it um, you know, is, is, is 90 or 120 or something like that. Um, but, but yes, if you have a county ordinance that um, exceeds the limits set by the state, you're going to have to change your ordinance. Uh, if the bill is signed by the law, and I know I know there were some questions about that. I know Kelly answered it. Uh, the bill has not been signed by the governor yet, but if the bill is signed into law, um, it would mandate that counties make that change. Understood. Thanks. Um, is HB 1014 requiring IDES to establish a wage insurance program? Is this simply routinely proposed, or is there a serious attempt to pass this bill? Mike, what was that number again? I'm sorry. Each bill. Cut out there for a second. House Bill 1014. And is that in the previous General Assembly or are they talking about the new General Assembly? It sounds, the question is phrased saying, is, is it a program that's routinely proposed? So I assume they're talking about the, uh, the, most recently concluded assembly. Um, give, give me one second to, to just. Look. Oh, I, they're talking about the new. Um, there's a new bill that was introduced. Um, I have not seen that specific language. If if I'm understanding the question right, um, so I'm not sure if this is a reissue of of, of uh, previous language. I, to me, this looks um, like new language. And so I, I'm not sure, you know, if I'll, I'll have to talk to the sponsor to see if they've introduced this before, but, but I'm not sure. I, I don't believe so. This, this to me looks relatively new. Thanks for that. Thanks if we're for, talking about House Bill 1014, which is introduced by Representative Flowers out of Chicago. We've got one final question. Um, uh, 
starts with the comment, the heaviest burden of tax bills in Kane County and the collar counties comes from school districts, not local and state government. And that's not likely to change since they see local property ownership as more stable than anything the state can offer, right? Um, you know, I, I would say statewide, um, the, the numbers that I'm familiar with is, is, is that's correct. Uh, I think about 60% um, to 70% of the property tax um, is school districts. Uh, and then the rest kind of break down, um, you know, from there. So yes, the school districts are, are the heaviest, um, I guess, user of, of local property taxes. There has been some discussion about, you know, making changes to that, you know, the, um, gosh, it's been, I think 2018 or 2017, uh, the last time we had some real major funding reform for, for schools. Um, it's still an issue. Uh, and, and I'm not quite sure if the state is ready to take on that, that burden, um, if I'm understanding the que question correctly, and fund schools out of the state's dollars rather than rely on uh, property taxes to, to fund school districts. There has been some conversation, and I know that the governor during his inaugural address um, announced that he would like to, um, you know, create some programs um, that would be free um, preschool uh, for all children throughout the state. And so we don't have details on that yet. I, I imagine during his budget, budget address, he'll outline some of um, where that funding is going to come from. But at this time, uh, again, you know, we're having a surplus or we're estimated to have a surplus of about $1.5 billion, give or take. Um, I don't think that's enough uh, of a surplus to, to relieve a significant um, majority of, of the property tax burden um, on property taxes for the state. I think we would need to have several more billions of dollars before, before we start seeing a shift um, in that direction. However, I, I could be wrong. It's all about the money. Well, we've reached the end of our hour together, um, and I just want to take a quick opportunity to thank Kelly and Taylor for their presentations today. Really appreciate your willingness to come back again this year and uh, help provide this uh, timely and useful information to the folks on our session today. As I mentioned earlier, if you registered for the webinar, uh, you'll receive the presentation materials and a link to the recording in a follow-up email. If you didn't register, drop your email in the chat and we'll get that information to you. I'd also like to invite you to visit our website to register for future webinars at go.illinois.edu slash LGE. For example, later this month on Tuesday, January 31st, again at high noon, you can join us for the second installment in a series of webinars on attracting rural residents. And also remember, you can always use the same extension resource to find recordings of a host of our prior presentations on a wide variety of topics. So with that, thank you all for attending today's webinar. Have a great day, have a great weekend, and we hope to see you back for future presentations. Thank you.